Yeah, most of this happened while we were praying. Yes, yeah, yes, amen. It did. It absolutely did. Good, good report. It was a good token just because right at the conclusion of the meeting, that's when it was announced to, you know, it, it was it was very affirming to everyone. Amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Tonight we're beginning the 24th chapter of Genesis. This is our 35th lesson. We'll have a series of lessons, I think three, on this uh, event that begins tonight. A wife for Isaac. We'll be viewing the first 21 verses of this 24th chapter. And Abraham was old and well stricken in age. And the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. And Abraham said to, the, to his eldest servant of his house that ruled over all that he had, Put, I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh. And I will make thee swear by the Lord, the God of heaven, and the God of, all the, uh, God of the earth, that thou shalt not take a wife unto my son of the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But thou shalt go unto my country and to my kindred, and take a wife unto my son Isaac. And the servant said unto him, Peradventure the woman will not be willing to follow me unto the land. Must I needs bring thy son again into the land from whence thou camest? And Abraham said unto him, Beware thou, that thou bring not my son thither again. The Lord God of heaven which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and which spake unto me, and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give this land. He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. And if the woman will not be willing to follow thee, then thou shalt be clear of this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. And the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swore unto him concerning that matter. And the servant took ten camels of the camels of his master and departed. All the goods of his master were in his, in his hand. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia under the city of Nahor. And he made his camels to kneel down without the city by a well of water at the time of the evening even the time that women go out to draw water. And he said, O Lord God of my master Abraham, I pray thee send me good speed this day, and show kindness unto my master Abraham. Behold, I stand here by the well of water, and the daughters of the men of the city come out to draw water. And let it come to pass that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee, that I may drink, and she shall drink, and she shall say, Drink, and I will give thy camels drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for thy servant Isaac, and thereby shall I know that thou hast showed kindness unto my master. It came to pass, before he had done speaking, that behold, Rebekah came out, who was born to Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother, with her pitcher on her shoulder. The damsel was very fair to look upon, the virgin, neither had any man known her, and she went down to the well and filled her pitcher and came up. And the servant ran to meet her and said, Let me, I pray thee, drink a little water of thy pitcher. And she said, Drink, my lord. And she hasted and let down her pitcher upon her hand and gave him drink. When she had done giving him drink, she said, I will draw water for thy camels also until they have done drinking. And she hasted and emptied her pitcher into the trough and ran again into the well to draw again under the well to draw water and drew for all his camels. And the man wondering at her held his peace. 
to wit whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. Amen. Now that being an astounding account to read in our day, yeah. <laughs> with all the revelation that's been received, you'd be hard pressed to find a man like that in our day. But this wasn't in our day. This is before the law. Is it before been hardly anything said about the Messiah at all? In fact, the only two things known about the Messiah was that, and that he was going to bruise the head of the serpent. And he hadn't been specified, but we knew that Abraham's seed, the whole world would be blessed through him. That, that's it. That's, that's it. That's it. Uh -huh. No moral code had been made known, no law. Sin hadn't been defined. But that's when this happened. And the fact that something like this doesn't happen today, that means today the people are worse than they were back then. A lot worse. Okay, so it's a serious, uh, serious thing. I wanted to just briefly rehearse what God had told Abraham. Well, it's important to keep in the back of your mind, what, what did Abraham know that he passed on to his servant? What kind of knowledge was, was available? What had God revealed? In between the age of 70 to 75, the Lord told him he'd make him a great nation. He said he'd bless him, said he'd make his name great, and Abraham himself would be a blessing. God would bless them that cursed, blessed Abraham and cursed them that cursed him. And in Abraham, all families of the earth would be blessed. About the age of 75, he expanded and said he, the land would be given to Abraham's seed after he got there. This land would give to your seed. We don't know what age the next happened, but it was a little later. God said he'd give him all the land he saw. Took him to a high place. All the land he saw would be his. And God would make his seed as a dust to the earth. He revealed that he would told him to walk through the land. Become familiar with it because I'm going to give it to you. Then a little later than that, what age we don't know, God told Abraham, I'm your shield. He's the first person that God ever said that to. I'm your shield. He said, I'm your exceeding great reward. He'd never said that to anybody else. He told him his servant Eliezer was not going to be his heir because Abraham thought that was a possibility. Told him his heir would come from his own bowels. Told him his seed would be as the stars of heaven. He told him, I brought you out of Ur of the Chaldees. He told Abraham that of a surety his seed would be strangers in a land for 400 years and they'd afflict him for 400 years. And that God would judge that nation for afflicted him. That Abraham would die in a good old age. Then in the fourth generation from him, in the fourth generation, his seed would come again to Canaan. The reason for the delay being the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. God told Abraham he'd give him the land from the river Euphrates, from the river Egypt to the river Euphrates. So he gave a kind of a definition of the land. And he named all the nations that would be displaced. It wasn't an idle land, it was an occupied land. Then at age 99, God told him he was God Almighty. That's the first time that. Said he'd make a covenant with Abraham. He'd exceedingly multiply Abraham. Said his covenant would be with him and he'd be a father of many nations. That his name would be changed to Abraham. That God had made him the father of many nations. He would be exceedingly fruitful. He'd make nations of Abraham. Kings would come out of him. He'd establish his covenant with Abraham and with his seed. He gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision as a token of the covenant. Sarai's name was changed to Sarah. He said he blessed Sarah. He'd give Sarah a son. She's, Abraham didn't know Sarah was going to be the mother until he was 99 years old. Until the year before, till the year before Isaac was born, he didn't know Sarah was going to have the child. So the Lord rebuked the people that have criticized Abraham. Amen. These people are ignorant and unlearned people. 
They have taught God's people wrong. I'm just giving you the facts here in the case. He also told us Sarah would be a mother of many nations and gave the name of the son would be Isaac. That he established his covenant with Isaac and was a seed after him. Then Abraham asked God that Ishmael might live before him. He wasn't asking that Ishmael would be the seed. Don't, don't forsake Ishmael. And God told him, I've heard you and I'm going to buy blessed Ishmael. I'm going to make Ishmael fruitful and multiply him exceedingly and 12 princes would be begotten of him and Ishmael would be a great nation. But his covenant would be established with Isaac. Also at age 99, he told him he'd return and Sarah would have a son. He also told him he wouldn't destroy the righteous with the wicked when he divulged this destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Then at the age of 102, Abraham was told to obey his wife and cast Hagar out and her son Ishmael. That in Isaac, in Abraham's seed, in Isaac, Abraham's seed to be called. God would make a great nation of Ishmael because he was Abraham's seed. Then somewhere between 130 and 137, God tries Abraham, commanding him to offer Isaac as a burnt offering. He tells him in blessing he'd bless Abraham. He'd multiply Abraham's seed. Abraham's seed would possess the gate of their enemies, and in his seed all nations of the earth would be blessed. That's, that's, I gave you a summation now of what, what Abraham knew, what God had revealed. All of the promises, every single one of them, pertain to this world and flesh and blood. Every single one of them. He received no promises pertaining to the world to come. No promise about eternal life, heaven, eternal inheritance, or remission of sins, reconciliation to God, nothing. Zero. I want to be able to make this clear. How would you think if you didn't know any of those things? I can guarantee you, you would not come up anywhere near what Abraham thought like. Now, why was this so? Why was it that we're talking now about nearly 2,500 years after Adam. This <laughs> is the time we're at here. We're at the time of almost about 2,000 years, 2,000 years to be precise, a little over, 2,000 years after Adam. This is all God had said. 2,000 years after. Why? Sin had so impacted the human race, God couldn't tell it very much. Mankind was so obtuse, even the best of men, they, he couldn't divulge this. He had to bring it up, bring him up to speed. And as time progressed, we're talking hundreds of years, centuries, sometimes millennia, the stream of revelation got wider as time proceeded. From Adam to Noah, it was, it was practically zero. Just It was practically zero. When it comes to about redemption, it was there, Noah didn't he know anything about that at all, except what, what, it, what Adam may have told him. From Noah to Abraham, there's very little was known. He didn't elaborate on any of this, so far as the record is concerned. He didn't elaborate on any of this. To Noah, or Ham, Shem, or Japheth, or no, they didn't know anything about this. But commencing with Abraham, things begin to pick up. But even from Abraham to Moses, there was still very sparse. You didn't know much more than it. there was God going to have a people and they were living in the land, and that's, that's about it. That's about all you knew. It's about all Joseph knew. Some of these saints intuitively knew that something good was on the horizon, but they didn't have any idea what it was. Then from Moses to the word becoming flesh, things really picked up quite a bit, even though the prophets, they said to some, but I wouldn't call it a lot. You could pretty much put it on a couple of pages of paper. Everything the prophets said about in details about the coming salvation, it was that they didn't, they didn't know that much. There's a words here and there, and a new heart, and a new spirit, and but it wasn't, uh, wasn't all, they, people couldn't make heads or tails out of it. It was kind of vague. 
but with John the Baptist. Yeah. Now the river starts getting really wide. Then when Jesus began his ministry, for the first time in the history of the world, a man talked about eternal life. Amen. Nobody had ever, to that time, nobody had ever asked one question, so far as the record's concerned, about eternal life, or commented on it, or mentioned it. But Jesus talked so much about it, that a young ruler came to him and asked him what he'd have to do to obtain it. Amen. Nobody had ever asked that question before. So things really began to expand, and then with Jesus, when Jesus was seated in heaven, it's like a waterfall, <laughs> like a deluge came on the day of Pentecost in a single sermon. Peter put it all together, told them about God pouring out His Spirit on all flesh. Said, "This is happening right before your eyes. You're seeing this." It was poured out on the men and the women. And the daughters prophesy. We dedicate that to people that are anti-women speaking in the church. The first grand meeting of the church, the women were very active. Their daughters were prophesied. We know they were because Peter said, this, this prophecy is fulfilled before your eyes. See, I was taught only the apostles talked. Hmm? I was taught only the apostles. But the, the apostles... Joel didn't prophesy about apostles. Amen. He prophesied about all flesh. Yeah. Yeah. About God's Spirit being poured out upon all flesh. Yeah. And it happened on the day of Pentecost. Yeah. Right. See? That was a like a that shook, shook a lot of things, just that. The point I'm making here is that the events of our text. As startling as they are, were took place in an environment that is hard to describe how little was really known. Because we've got we've grown accustomed to a lot, knowing a lot about what God's doing. See, we've grown accustomed to it. It's hard for us to imagine someone not knowing these things. In fact, I've heard preachers preach just like these people knew everything they know. They preached just like they did. And they criticized them just like they had all the information we got, except they were disobedient. Hmm? Yeah. See, this isn't even honest. This, you, you, can't, you can't be a, like, even take a neutral position. Just read the Bible and you'd know that wasn't true. But that's when these things took place that we're, they were going to read about. So with that, uh, I want to lay the groundwork for that. We'll begin. Now Abraham is old, well stricken with age. But age hadn't dulled his spiritual capacities, we'll find. His body was old. Actually, he was going to live quite about 38 more years and have six more children after this. <laughs> but that's because God extended by reason of strength, extended his age, old and well stricken in age. Sarah just recently had died at 127. That means at that time Abraham was 137, so he's somewhere between 137 and Isaac's going to get married at 40, so he's somewhere in that range. So he's going to live quite a while longer, Mary Keturah, have six more sons, but it says that he was old and well stricken in age. But this is the human point of view. This is from the standpoint of flesh. Just to let you know, God's purpose, if it relied upon Abraham himself and upon his personal natural capabilities, it would never happen. Uh -huh. he was, Abraham was too old yeah. for nations to come out of him. That's why it says to draw attention to the fact, see, to draw attention to the fact that the birth of Isaac was a miracle. The following progeny were miracle, was a miracle. Abraham's longevity was a, because of divine, divine work. It wasn't according to nature. Old and well stricken in years. But now that gives some insight into what the psalmist meant when he said, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat. They shall be fat and flourishing. Now that's pretty hard on people who want to retire the old. I mean, I understand it's 
That's pretty difficult, but that's what the scripture says, isn't it? But I will tell you, you will be hard pressed to find a church. There are some, but you have to really hunt for them. A church that doesn't say you're washed up at 50. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Right. Very few churches would hire a minister. That's right. 50. Yeah. Older than that, forget it. Why? Now, this isn't true of the rest of the world. Understand. This is unique to the Western world. But God didn't think that way. Why I'm saying this, but God didn't think this way. He's going to bring forth a nation from an old man and an old woman. Now, he, he could have done it from a young man and a young woman that was impotent, that was barren. He could have, he could have done that. Sarah was barren when she got married. She could have done it back then. It had been just as much a miracle. But folk wouldn't have thought it was a miracle. They just said, oh, we were... <laughs> We are wrong about Sarah. She, she really wasn't barren. Uh -huh. They couldn't say that after this. Yeah, See, So this is God. God works things so nobody else really can get the credit for it. That's the way he is. And again, David prayed, Now also when I am old and gray-headed, O God, forsake me not until he's old and gray-headed now until I have showed thy strength unto this generation. Let me, let me tell it to this generation. When I'm old and gray-headed, Lord, let me tell it to them. And again, Jeremiah wrote, Jeremiah 17, 8, He shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth forth her roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh, but her leaves shall be green and shall not be careful in the year of drought, neither shall cease from yielding fruit. I like the thought of it. Now with the advent of advanced education and professionalism and career management, religious men have lost a sense of the value of godly age. Now when you talk about a senior's ministry, you're talking about Branson trips. Well, I'm telling you the truth here now. You don't have to go out of the town to find this. Talking about Branson trips and retreats. and You're not talking about doing any work for the Lord. You're not talking about that. God does. He does. You suppose you could find someone in our generation that would choose a man that was 100 and a woman that was 90 to bring forth the most significant offspring until that time in the history of the world and have to raise them or that they would select a Zacharias and Elizabeth who are both well stricken and they choose them to have the next most significant person next to Jesus that was ever born of humanity and that old couple had to raise him up a Nazarite Huh? He couldn't eat anything came from a grape, from the vine to the root. It'd be like raising a kid up and never eat candy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh? be quite a job, wouldn't it? They he chose an old couple to do that. Or who would select Simeon, an aged man, to, to dedicate the Christ child? Or Anna, who was over a hundred, to go out and tell everybody who was waiting for redemption in Jerusalem, he's here, he's here. But God did. God did it. We don't have that many that are of age among us, but you learn to think like this when you're young. You won't have trouble when you're old. That age doesn't mean anything to God. Amen. You can be fat and flourishing and fruitful and used in, the, in an extraordinary way in God's kingdom when you're old. In fact, that's kind of been my desire. See, when God's in the equation, when you think, when your thinking's God-centered, you just think differently. You don't think the same way. When Paul and his company were traveling about, they stayed with a man named Naaman, who was an old disciple. He was an old disciple. Uh, now he didn't keep, like, the youth group. He kept Paul and the people that traveled with him at Quite a blessing. Yeah, but, you know, I, saw, I was thinking about this this morning, you know. <clears throat>
When Jesus was here, he was a prodigious worker. Yeah. Always laboring. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of rest time. There just really wasn't. He wore out the disciples. <laughs> and he wore out his, his own self and the journeys and his teachings and things. And he said one time, he says, I work and my father works. Yeah, that's yeah. right. They don't have rest like people think of rest. Yeah. Because when people think of the world to come, they think of like being idle. That's and right. Maybe we'll do some singing and, yeah. you know, and then we'll just rest some more. And that's kind of their, the furthest extent they have. Yeah. But this doesn't this doesn't match up with yeah. with how God is. The it's world right. to come is going to be a place of prodigious labors. So it doesn't make sense when you're when you're like at the peak of your understanding, even though your body is wearing out, yeah. that you would cultivate yourself to just be leisurely and that doesn't that doesn't make no. any sense at all. If you're Amen. preparing for a world that's Amen. Be a laboring world. Amen. <laughs> Now it says of Abraham when he was of old age, <clears throat> the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. <clears throat> now if you want an assignment that's a pretty tough assignment, see if you can find out a definition for bless that satisfies you. Now I spent considerable time and now I've come up dry as a gourd. I list some of the most advanced comments here. They really didn't say a whole lot. Why? Well, I think God doesn't intend for blessed to be defined lexically or by dictionaries. It's the sort of thing that is best understood by experience. And God told Abraham several times, I'm going to bless you. Several times he said, I give you some of the texts here. He said, I'm going to bless you. He said, I'll bless you exceedingly and multiply your fruit and I'll make you a blessing. And several times he, he said this. I will bless thee. Genesis 12, 3. And we know that Abraham, he was blessed. But it says he blessed in all things. When he's in Haran, he picked up some substance there, text says. He, get, he left Haran for Canaan with all they, their substance they had gathered and the souls they'd gotten in Haran. So he said he'd bless them, so he'd increase. Then when he got into Egypt, Pharaoh gave some gifts to Abram, gave him sheep, oxen, donkeys, male and female servants, female donkeys and camels. It's when Abraham went out of Egypt, said he was very rich. God said, I'll bless you. See, remember, you get blessed then didn't have to do with heavenly places in that. We're not at that stage in history yet. So this, this is the only thing really Ben could understand. See, they could only understand this kind of blessing. God's going to culture them to understand what blessing really is. But it's going to take a long time. It's going to take centuries to get to work men into a condition where they can understand what bless means and what heavenly places means and what eternal life means. Now you think of how great a transgression it is that God finally got people to where they could kind of kind of understand this and then now we're living in an age when everybody's forgot it. Yeah. See how serious that is? This is, what, this is what Babylon the Great has done. Yeah. Babylon the Great was just Satan's fabricated church. He's washed. All this stuff has been washed away so people don't think this way. So you hear things, I don't want, I won't, I don't want pie in the sky by and by. And I know we go to heaven and we die. I, know, I, I, want, I want it now. It's just preached. And it's very popular. In fact, this is the only popular preaching of our day. So Abraham, this is about all he could understand. He gained substance. He did. Melchizedek declared Abraham blessed of the Most High God. See, God said he'd bless him. Now Melchizedek confirmed he had. Melchizedek affirmed that God was, had blessed Abraham by delivering his enemies into your hands. So that kind of expanded the idea of blessed, not only possessions, your enemies. Remember, he took 318 of his servants and they routed four kings in their armies who had continued the entire part of that world he'd conquered. And Abraham and his, these 318 men chased these kings down, defeated them, 
overthrew them. Why? God gave his enemies yeah. into his hands. <laughs> How many there are, that isn't even the point. One can chase a thousand, two can chase ten thousand. God declared to Abraham, I'll surely make a great nation. The nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. That's in Genesis 18. And then Abimelech, he contributed, as I said, to Abraham's wealth. He gave him sheep and oxen, men, servants. So Abraham's old, stricken in age. And he can uh, say the same thing Joshua said to Israel. He said there, there failed not aught of any good thing which God hath promised, has spoken to the house of Israel, all came to pass. That's what Joshua said. That's what Abraham could say. God said he's going to bless me. And he did. He blessed me. He can say the same thing Solomon prayed. Blessed be the Lord that hath given rest unto his people Israel according to all that he promised. There hath not failed one word of his good promise, which he promised by the hand of Moses, his servant. See? So this is always the history of God's people. God promises you bless them. And after they've lived, they say, I've been blessed. Amen. Everything God said come to pass. And now it's being lived out right here in Abraham. Now here's this he knows his work isn't finished yet. He calls his oldest servant in. And he hasn't now adopted, because he's been blessed, he hasn't adopted a personal agenda. That's something else to draw attention to. Yes. That Abraham kept, even though he's blessed, had a lot of possessions, advanced, even though that he, he held to God's agenda. Amen. See, it's how, not how much you have isn't the point. It's how do you handle what you have. Amen. Do you handle it like you got it from God? Which you did. No matter what it is. You see, he blessed Abraham in all things. So everything that he, God did that. So now he sticks with God's agenda. He knows that God's promised his seed. So now he's thinking about the future seed. Who is it going to be? Calls his personal servant in. Eldest servant. So a lot of people have thought this was Eliezer. It could have been Eliezer. He was uh, 68 years before this. He was the head servant. So I suppose he could have lived that long. I don't know. It, doesn't, it never says it was Eliezer. But he calls him in. Ruled over all. He said, now I've got something I want you to swear. I want you to put your hand under my thigh here. Exactly what that meant, I'm not sure. I'll give you what the authorities say it was. It was a way of like laying your hand in the Bible. You just put the hand under the thigh. He did it. Jacob had Joseph do the same thing. When Jacob was getting ready to die, he had Joseph put his hand under his thigh and make a vow. I said, I'm going to make, I want you to make a vow now before the most high of heaven you're going to do something. Now see this is uh, this kind of uh, respect and commitment is kind of unknown in our society. Something is of this gravity. It's just, it's, it, people just don't do things. Well I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I'm not about to make a promise like that. I don't see they, they don't do things like this. But the people Walked with God did. Now you say, now this, Eliezer, what I'm going to test you to do, this has got to be done. You will not take a wife unto my son from the daughter of the Canaanites. Now see a disinterested person say, I'm going to die. I, I really prefer that my son not marry a Canaanite, but I'm not. That's going to happen probably after I'm gone. And I'm. This isn't how Abraham thought. He is living today, he'd make sure that his children knew everything he knew so they could learn some more. He'd pass it on. Now I'm part of a I'm part of a family. I'm the 
second generation, and I have a brother that's the third generation, but we don't know of many families that go beyond that. We're kind of unusual to have three generations that, that serve God. This, this is kind of unusual. But this isn't how these people thought. See, God is, I'm going to bless the whole world through this, through you. Before he had any children, before he had any children now, he told him this, and now, now he has, he has the seed now, Isaac. So he's thinking of that promise. Don't take my son's wife from the Canaanites. Now, Abraham was living among the Canaanites at the time, but he was as a stranger and a sojourner. He, the, the land wasn't his yet. It was going to be given to him, but it hadn't because the iniquity of the people hadn't filled up yet. The land still belonged to them. And the citizens there were those were Canaanites. Don't take a wife. <clears throat> See, he knew that the Abraham's promise to him and to his seed, and he knew that his seed couldn't mingle with the seed of the enemy. Even there's no, there's no record that God told him this. But he knew this. He could reason this out. I can't, we can't have Isaac marrying somebody God has not promised to bless. We can't do that to Eliezer. I'm, I'm counting on you making sure this doesn't, this doesn't happen. See, he perceived a truth that really hasn't been spelled out to this point. I suppose it is possible God revealed this to him, but I think it would have been made clear that he had, but he revealed enough to him that a sound thing in person could reason this out. If the promise is to me and my seed, then the seed's got to be kept pure. Amen. You, know, you used to read texts like love not the world with that in mind. <laughs> Don't love the world. You, you, by loving the world, you teach your children to love the world too. Then we got mingled seed on our hand. Amen. Don't take it from the Canaanites. <laughs> now later God will tell Israel not to intermarry with the heathen, but he hadn't said anything to this point here. And you think that how few seed there was, kindred, he's only one of it, he had one brother. Yeah. <laughs> We're not talking about a great nation up there someplace. He had one brother. And they had some offspring, a couple of generations that came from them. Lot had a couple of daughters, but they weren't living in here. They weren't in the home country. So you don't have a lot of people to choose from. See? Some people make bad choices because they say they're not a good, enough good choices, so I'll, so I'll t settle for a bad choice. No, not here. No, you can't. You can't do that. Have to take a son from, uh, not from among the Canaanites. Don't do it. Now, Elias wants to make sure he understands everything before he goes. He doesn't strike out of the mission until it's clear in his mind. He said, well, what if the woman doesn't, doesn't want to come back? Because he knows he's got, he's got to bring the wife back. What if she doesn't want to come back? Do you want me to come back and get Isaac and take him to her? <laughs> well, I hope you can see the parallels here. That I'm not going to have time to develop it all, but there's... <laughs> if they're not willing to come here, we ain't willing to go there. We're not willing to send Isaac down there to do a little training work. We're going to tell you right up front, tell them right up front, tell her right up front what's expected. Yeah. And if she doesn't want to come, come on back. That's right. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. Hard stuff, isn't it? Yeah. If she's not willing, don't take him back. Well, by saying take, take him thither or back, it doesn't mean that he'd been there before. It meant we're not going to go back to the starting point. We're not going to go back to the starting point again. I've already, we've already come out. We've already come out of the Chaldees. We've already come out of Mesopotamia. We're not about to go back. No wonder the apostle says, go on to perfection. 
Don't go back to the beginning again. This is disastrous. So some people have to go back, go back, go back, start over again, make new vows. So are you saying people like that are lost? I'm saying no, I'm just saying they're dumb. They're toying with the devil. No, you can't go back. It'd be this is just when you teach your children. Yeah. Teach them, don't you dare marry anybody from the world yeah. and make it as sound as bad as it really is. Yeah. Amen. Tell them the curse of God will be on you because he said don't burn it unequally yoked together. He won't receive you because he said come up from among them and be separate and then I'll receive you. Tell them, be that plain about it. Yeah, right. You won't Brother, pick that, you, yes. Yeah, I, I've talked to my children especially Logan now, she's um, 17, about the importance of having a godly spouse, that it is really better to be alone than it is to have an ungodly spouse. Oh, yes. Amen. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah you... Thank you, honey. You have to teach... You have to teach your children this. It's not... I mean, none of us like having to do this but this is what this is what you have to do because this is the truth beware don't bring my son again don't don't put yourself in a position where God has to call Isaac out of or too out of Mesopotamia too he's already called he's already called me out once I'm gonna call me out again yes in the parallels how in in the revelation it speaks about how the bride comes from yeah. God out of heaven down from heaven yeah. to to be with Christ as well so it doesn't he, yes he comes to bring us there but it's not that he comes to bring us it's because we can't get there on our own yet but we do come from God because that's the picture of we yeah. are like him yes amen mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. now here's the mindset of uh, of faith <clears throat> Once a person is called of God and they know it, the next thing on the agenda is press toward the mark. Amen. Move on to perfection. Amen. That's the next thing on the agenda. Yeah, that's right. Is, well, some people, they live in such a way they're always having to start over. In fact, this is the groundwork for all recovery programs. Right. All recovery, recovery programs approach it. They, give you, they let you go back. They don't, they don't tell you to go back, but they, they, they say it's kind of, we understand you will, you know. But there's no provision in salvation for going back. Yes, now, if a person wakes up there and repents, there's, there is forgiveness. But yes. salvation itself doesn't allow for going back. You had to get out of the, you had to get under the influence, out from under the influence of salvation to go back. That's right. You had to quench the spirit and leave Christ, so forth, to go back. Now then, he, he reasons on this. And notice the way he reasons. He says, The Lord God of heaven which took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred and which spake unto me and that swear unto me, saying, Unto thy seed will I give thee this land. See? God called me out of that land. I can't go back into it in my mind, in my heart. I can't allow my children to go back to it. He called me out of it, and I'm staying out of it. See, this is how, this is how he reasoned. God took me out. In regard to the inheritance, I've made this much progress. That's right. That's right. I've, I've taken, I've taken that my, for my part, I've gone this far. That's right. And and we're gonna pick it up from there and move on. Move and on we ahead. can't go yeah. back. That's right. He's now in the place of the inheritance. That's right. Mm -hmm. We are now in the place of the inheritance. Yeah, that's right. Heavenly places. That's now right. Go back. Let's stay there. Amen. Now, there's, because a lot of people have said derogatory statements about Abraham coming out of Ur of the Chaldees, I was taught this. Some people, some of you maybe have been taught it too, that Abraham didn't come out like he was told to. He, he lingered around, and then he came out with Tira and and took a lot too and got in trouble because of it and all right so I think it's important to know how the scriptures talk about Abraham coming out of Ur of the Chaldees so I'll give that to you Genesis 11 31 says he left with Tira and Lot it's one view 
Genesis 12, 4 says, So Abraham departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Turn the prison of a little blender. Genesis 15, 7. He said unto him, the Lord said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of her of the Chaldees. Oh, yeah. so now I'm got, getting down a little closer. Later in Nehemiah's day, the people, the people knew this. They said, Thou art the Lord the God who did choose Abram and broughtest him forth out of Ur of the Chaldees. See, mm -hmm. they knew the truth of the matter. Amen. Stephen preached about this. Here's what he said. Men, brethren, fathers, hearken, the God of glory appeared unto our father Abram when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Charon, and said unto him, Get thee out of thy kindred and from thy uh, country and from thy kindred and come to a land which I will show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans. That's how Stephen said it. I want more testimony from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 11, 8. By faith, Abram, when he was called to go out, to a place which he should have to receive for it, and inherits obeyed, and he went out. See, that's how, now that's how. Yeah. See, why? There's a talk there. What's the different stages? God brought him out. That's all things are of God. Yeah. See? Abraham obeyed. That's God working in him to will and do his own good pleasure. He left with Terah and Lot. That's according to appearance. Yeah. Amen. See? But it's the same. Uh -huh. yeah. mm -hmm. So the prophets interpret. That's right. They tell us yeah. what really happened from God's perspective. You preach anything else, you're not preaching. That's right. And you've judged according to appearance. That's See, right. they judge according to appearance, but it wasn't. This was not a proper judgment because the scriptures tell you, God brought them out. So there's a full depiction of Abraham leaving Ur of the Chaldees. Well, he asked. Uh, his elder servant to swear to him that he'd do that, and the elder servant said he would. Yes, I'll do it. He swear unto me, that swear unto me, saying unto thy seed, will I give this land. Now here's a type that I want to develop briefly here. A principle unveil that exposes an error in judgment that's common in our day. Yes. All right, now I want to first establish that spiritual life is the most significant life of all. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. See, righteousness. Yeah. Acquisition of riches. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Your fundamental quest. Seek the things that are above. Your primary appetite. Set your affection on things above. Proper use of your body. Present your body a living sacrifice to God. Amen. Amen. Holy, acceptable. Your obligation to glorify God. You're bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit which are God's. Your purpose for life. Live henceforth unto him that died for you and rose again. Now to assist us in this uh, kind of focus, whatever we do, these some people say, what am I going to do about working? What am I going to do about family life? How do I handle that? Well, to assist us, whatever you do, word or in deed, down to eating and drinking, do all for the glory of God. That's Amen. how you do it. That's how you do it. You live for God. Amen. Now these Requirements are typified in Abraham going to Canaan and remaining there Amen. and walking by faith through the land. He himself would never leave the land yeah. and he'd never receive a part of it as an inheritance. Yeah. Now many, he was the, he focused on my point here is he focused on the main thing and in life with Christ, focusing on the main thing, this is, this is critical. Yes, amen. But there's a lot of people that err in their judgment. 
They get caught up in secondary things. Involvements that of themselves aren't wrong, but they bleed off their energies and require too much of their persons. Maybe they're seeking financial security. Maybe they want to develop a career. Maybe there's certain luxuries that they would like to have. They, but they forget this word. Let your conversation or your life be without covetousness and be content. Yeah. Be content with such things as you have, for he has promised, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. See, that's in the Bible. Amen. Amen. It isn't preached very much today, but it is there. And these people, I, I feel, I grieve for them, feel sorry for them. They always are giving God a wore out lamb. Their minds are all wore out, bodies all wore out, emotions all wore out. They've given themselves to other things. Now they come and they, get, they haven't really got a lot left. Now, whatever can be said in defense of that, and I'm sure that some things can be said, is not a wise thing. When God says all, for you to give part. Yes, amen. Yes. Amen. It's a life in Christ. If anyone's serious, they'll, they'll see that it, this is a first fruit experience. That's no right. one in Christ is ever going to receive the full inheritance while they're here. Amen. It's like Abraham yes. didn't receive a part of it there. He didn't, but it was promised to him. Oh, yes. And he lived in the anticipation of that, and that anticipation that faith drove him to was enough to sustain him. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Abraham wouldn't even leave to go get a wife right. for Isaac. Yeah, yeah. Amen. <laughs> yeah, the type that. is there. The type that's is right. There. That's right. That's right. Receiving the inheritance from another place. That's right. You know that word "seek ye first." That doesn't always have to do with like succession in time. That that has Primary. to do with preference. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. So that's that right. really should be the opposite. You know, you give your best to the Lord, and then if there's anything left, you give your dregs all to those things. Other other that's right. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Now, the next thing Abraham says is most, most phenomenal. He says, He shall send his angel before thee, and thou shalt take a wife unto my son from thence. He shall send an angel before thee? Mm -hmm. Angels are not mentioned in Scripture until Genesis 16, 7 through 11, where one visited Hagar. Yeah. Uh -huh. hmm? You don't have like a glorious history of angels prior to Abraham. Well, I don't have anything like this. The next place they're mentioned is when two of them came to destroy Sodom. Next, an angel appeared to Hagar after she and Ishmael had been cast out. It's going to why it's marvelous that Abraham said this. One angel appeared to Abraham when he's about to offer Isaac, remember? Stayed his hand. The point is that Abraham had not been taught by word about angels. Or what they did. You, I mean, you know there's ministering spirits, but see that, that morsel of knowledge apparently hadn't been made known yet. But it seems to me that faith kind of intuitively yeah. knew about this, that he knew God will make provision for you to get safely where you're going. Amen. Now I tell you, uh, Every new convert can be told this. They can say, now we can, let me tell you, new convert, you've been baptized into Christ, but now if you trust in God, he'll make sure you get there. Yeah. Yeah. He'll, he'll send, his angels will minister to you, and there'll be people of his that he'll send to you, and he can get you there. See, they need to be told this right off, right out of the baptistry. They need to be told this, assured of, it, of this. Been 40 years since angels visited their tent. <laughs> right. He didn't know that they were angels. He knew they were messengers yeah. from the Lord, angels, and went and he likely had heard what happened to Lot and how they were spared. Yeah. The angels went before them. Yes. Now he talks about it here. Uh -huh. So see, but what little bit he knew, he uh -huh. retained. You yes. kind of yeah. pick up on that, don't you? Just the slightest thing yes. that God was involved in was stored in the. That's right mind of this patriarch and he then he where he worked with that kind of knowledge and made some good deductions. Yeah, brother. He was a 
was able to make a connection. Uh, you know, whenever the angel spared uh, uh, Isaac, yeah. that was like the... the yeah, the, the, there you go. He was yeah. able to make the connection between the seed and the carrying on. Yes. Of that yes. Amen, the very good. And yes. And that we yes. have the same type in Christ Jesus. That that's he right. Said, he that's begun a good work in you, he uh, will perform. Amen. That, was a, that same line of reasoning. Right? Amen. See, faith has a, has a logic of its own. It reasons a certain way. Mm -hmm. And it can be given just a very little quantitatively, but it can make the most out of it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Tony. You see that what was going on now was the most important thing. That's right. This is the most important thing. God had done, uh, revealed himself too many times. This is the scarcity of it, we understand. Yeah. But he, the Abraham, he done pointed this out too many times. To him, this is the, the most important thing he could be living right. for. Amen. This is the heir. So faith has a powerful effect on the way people think. It does. And if you sometime in your own private assessment will review, you'll find your faith has made a has had a significant effect on how you think and how you assess things. <clears throat> Then he brings up this matter of the woman not being willing. Yet the woman will not be willing to follow thee, and thou shalt be clear from this my oath. Only bring not my son thither again. Servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham his master and swear to him con concerning that matter. You see how precise the thought is there? Now, unfortunately, in our day, Christians are not generally considered to be strong in, in thinking. I hate to say that, but most of the world knows it. But they was very strong and strong in thinking. If the woman's not be willing to come, don't compromise. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Don't try and negotiate. Yeah, amen. Don't try and talk her into it. Mm -hmm. Free from the oath. You don't have to go any further. If she's unwilling, Drop the project right there. Because any anyone you gain by compromise, yeah. you'll have to compromise to keep them. That's, right. Amen. Amen. That's the way it works. So the patriarch affirms the unwillingness of the prospect to come to Canaan and freed the servant from his oath. Didn't have to go any further. Now I want to draw a parallel in salvation here. The real servant did not begin this journey till everything was straight in his mind. Yeah. He didn't get on. He didn't get on the road or load the camels or fix up the caravan. He didn't start until the instructions were clear in his mind. All right. Now let's have let's hear from the scripture some pre-journey instructions. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. See, you can't, you can't even get on the road till you agree to this. Amen. In your mind, you've got to concur with this requirement. Or the, the straight gate won't open, and you'll have no access to the narrow road. That's just the way it is, see? But you'd be hard-pressed to find someone that really say it just like that, but that's what Jesus said. Yeah. And whoever doesn't agree with that, you're under no obligation. Yeah, amen. <laughs> huh? So you're trying to bring them to Christ and you're laboring with it and you're trying to win them to Christ or however you put but they don't agree to these terms, you're free under no obligation. That's right. Move on to the next person. Yes. Maybe they'll have more success than you. Yes. Maybe they won't too. The Holy Spirit's under no obligation to continue his work where he's resisted. If he's grieved or quenched or resisted, He's under no obligation to go any further. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. 
Why do you think he said don't grieve and don't quench him? Why do you think he said that? Yeah. Yes, amen. Yes, Brother yeah, Robert. That's why it says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of your power. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just all the people out there, not all of them are God's people. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it is. Amen. See, it's true that God so loved the world He gave His only begotten Son. But that doesn't mean that God will relax the requirements in order to save somebody. Amen. It doesn't mean that. He cannot deny Himself. He can't deny himself. He that believeth not shall be damned in the holes. Right. People need to be heard. I back to this generation. Now look, if you, people that do the things you're doing mm -hmm. won't inherit the kingdom of God. We got a word on this. We got a word on this. Mm -hmm. yeah. You may not believe it, but I do. Amen. A lot of more similar warnings. <clears throat> so the servant agreed to the terms, mm -hmm. took ten camels. Here's how text says he had to charge all the goods of his master. The idea is he ruled over all the house. He selected things from the different categories of wealth and laid it up ten camels. I got a camel caravan down there. So it's a real ten camel caravan. You can only imagine how much how much things he loaded there. How much water they drink? Oh yeah, we're gonna yeah I'm gonna <laughs> don't, 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 don't beat me to this. I make it a ma got a major point on that. <laughs> ten camels. That's that's what he's gonna have to offer to who comes. Now see there. There are stipulations about who can come, but once the person agrees, hey, there's a lot of things we got to tell them. Yeah, amen. Promise of the Holy Spirit, the gift of eternal life, reconciliation with God, justification from all things, peace with God, never thirst, out of your belly flow rivers of living water, not be confounded, the promise of blessing, being turned away from your iniquities, Jesus giving you repentance, not condemned, and a host of other things. We got a Lord, yeah. we got a caravan of blessings. Amen. We can tell the people who agree to come to Christ. We, we got something to tell you. What's a lot of things coming? So he went to Mesopotamia. Mesopotamia was a large region, stretched from Babylon down to the southeast, all the way up to Haran in the northwest. Nahor is a hard place to identify, but apparently, right close to Haran. A trip of about 700 miles, a chart there, caravan of 10 camels, and he uh, he went there. I was interested to know how far a camel travels in a day, so I found out that the average camel, even back then, was 35 miles a day. They move right along, so that'd be about 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 20 days, 20 day trip. I mean, sometimes uh, we have brethren that go to a foreign country and it's a two-day trip. Mm -hmm. They're wore out when they get there. Yeah. And they're not walking. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they're sitting all the way and they're tired to get there. Yeah, you can kind of imagine this. 20 miles. 20 days. When he got there, he made his camels kneel down without the city by a well of water. He knew, he knew where, to, where to locate, by a well of water. <clears throat> yeah, when you camp, you do want to camp by, um, by a well of water. Get some nourishment. See, some people are looking the wrong place. They don't find anything, and for years they search and they search and they search, and they can't find what, what because they're hunting the wrong place. They're not by the well of water. They're not where God delivers signs and blessings. See? You can see that, I'm sure. Now, Jesus, he, uh, he taught publicly. People had an interest in him. Toward the things of God, they'd, they'd find where he was. There's no incident in Scripture where someone said, come over to my house and Give me a little private tutelage. Nicodemus went, but he went to him privately. 
Jesus said of his ministry, I spake openly in the world I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. See? That's where the Jews, that's where the Jews tended to gather, synagogue, temple. So that's where Jesus was, synagogue, temple. Sometimes he'd go by the seaside, sometimes on a mountain. But the people came to him. That's what the servants are. He's positioned in a place where the prospective bride can come to him. Because he doesn't know how to find one going to them. Now Jesus invited uh, people to come to him, but there's a certain place they had to be. Like, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. See? If any man will, you want to come after him. And so forth. Now the candor of which Jesus spoke about following him and what was required and so forth, where to be, is kind of amazing in view of today's society. I'm going to liken this to the spirit seeking a bride for Christ. John the Baptist was the first person to speak about the Messiah as a bridegroom. He said in John 3.29, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which was himself, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. <laughs> so he's the first one that talked about Jesus as a bridegroom. And when Jesus came, he came to the right place. The prophet Isaiah said he'd come to the region of Galilee. That's where he came. He didn't go to Rome. He didn't, you see, he didn't go to Alexandria, Egypt. He went to Galilee. People who knew the Bible, they knew light's going to spring up in Galilee. So informed people when they heard about this prophet in Galilee, they could put to it, put it together. We want, we're going to hear this man. So Jesus, when he came, he came where the people could come to him. And people want to find him, they've got to find a place where Jesus is. Now he gets there, he's by this well of water, and he prays. Well, prayer was very unusual in these days. He prays. He knows why he's been sent out to find a wife for Isaac. He knows that. He knows what land to go to, natives, Abram's native land. He knows what part of the land to go to, it's the part where the Abram's kindred are, but that's about all he knows. So he prays. Now, I don't know if you've thought about how many prayers are noted before this in Scripture, but not many. Cain spoke to God. He had a dialogue with God, but I don't know if that could be called prayer or not, but he did. Abraham called upon the name of the Lord at least three different times. Abraham reasoned with God about who would, who would be his heir. He reasoned with God concerning not destroying the righteous, but... See, the first time prayer to God in any of the forms of that word, pray, praying, prayed, the first time it's ever mentioned is Genesis 20, verse 7, where God told of him, like, Abraham will pray for you. That's the first time that word's mentioned in the Bible. Yeah, I'm showing you here, this servant did something that it looked like couldn't be done. <laughs> the next time we read about prayer, is when Abraham did pray for Abimelech, just a few verses later. And then you don't read about anybody praying for centuries until Moses prayed to the Lord for Israel in Numbers 11, 21. Now this, I'm showing you that the subject of prayer was not like a taught yeah. subject. Two more instances of Moses praying are when he prayed for Aaron. He said he prayed for Aaron. Two times it says, prayer or praying is not mentioned after that until the time of the judges. So I gather from this that 
people had to be taught over an extended period, like how to come to God with a petition or a, address Him in some way. It took a long time before anybody could really do this. Now here the servant does this. I gather he picked up on this from the servant Abraham. Confirms that spiritual death did occur when Adam and Eve sinned. Men were no longer comfortable in the presence of God. Now in the day of salvation, see the heavens have been opened. The access, not only is the access open to go, but the access is open for things to come. Amen. See, <laughs> talk about a new and living way, you want to think it's a two-way. <laughs> People are going there, blessings are coming here. All of this, to me, accents the remarkable awareness of this servant. The, thing, the things he knew. It's absolutely amazing. I know people today that wouldn't think to pray like that. Yeah. Like he's going to pray. Now when he prays, he says, um, send me good speed. We would say give success. It would clear the way. Why do, well, my master, he didn't say this, but my master told me you would send your angel. Remember? Remember? He's praying for this, for the age to go to work now. <laughs> Give me good speed, success in my journey. In other words, you ensure that I find the bride I've been sent out to find. But he's not thinking of himself. He says, he says then I'll feel good because you helped me. He says, you'll be showing kindness to my master. I'm thinking about my master here. And how that will bless my master. Yeah. <laughs> you got to get that down in your soul. Amen. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. See, you get that down in your soul. It, what blesses us is when the Lord's blessed. Amen. As it blesses us. Now here's a type of the reason, but for my master. For my master. Here's a type of reason it's in salvation. Paul wrote to the brethren that, Rome, that he besought them for Christ's sake. See, there he is, thinking about somebody else. For Christ's sake. He said in uh, 1 Corinthians 4.10, we're fools for Christ's sake. Paul took pleasure in hardships he endured for Christ's sake. God forgave us for Christ's sake. This is kingdom thought, see. It's not self-centered, it's God-centered, see. Different kind of, this selfless spirit is in every aspect of the kingdom of God. Every facet of spiritual life, selflessness characterizes it. It's an indelible mark. Now as I stand here by this well, he says, and the daughters of men of the city come out to draw water, let it come to pass, that the damsel to whom I shall say, let down thy pitcher, I pray thee that I may drink. She shall say, Drink, I will give thy camels a drink also. Let the same be she that thou hast appointed for my, thy servant Isaac. That thou hast appointed. Well, see, now here's the way men reason. Men say, well, if there's predestination, then why is there preaching? Isn't that what they say? If God elects, then why, why should we do anything? Well, so who we've appointed, he made this 700 mile trip, has all these gifts, he prays to be alert, so he'll, so, so he'll know who God appointed. I tell you, his perception and boldness is remarkable. So he asked a couple of things, very precise. When I asked the woman, for a drink, she'll let down her pitcher to give me a drink, like I say. And then after she gives me a drink, she'll, she'll volunteer to water the camels. Those are the two things I'm asking you to do. And so uh, he's learned from Abraham. So my point here, brethren, is he, learned, he was raised in Abraham's house, and you couldn't be in Abraham's house without learning about the God of Abraham. This is just what happened. You'd pick up on it, and then I'll know. If this, if this woman does this, then I'll know that you showed kindness to my master. Now, 
he's still in the act of praying. He hasn't finished praying yet. And while he's praying, here comes Rebecca. And he said that she let down her pitcher. She's got her pitcher. And she's born unto Bethuel, son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, Abraham's brother. So she's a kinfolk. As an example, how fast communication between heaven and earth happens. See, here he prayed, he's in the act of praying before he finished. Here it comes. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> here she comes. And he watches her. Sure enough, she goes down and gets some water in her pitcher. Faith can easily take hold of the subservience of men to the living God. See, it can say, that, Oh, I know this is what this is what you wanted for me. Now, now that I've been blessed in this place here, I, I could tell this this is where you wanted me, Lord. It, now that I've met so and so and they've ministered to me, now I know that you you sinned and this is what you wanted. This is how he's thinking. And Rebecca, she came up out of the well. Now, I, I have a picture here of the kind of wells they're talking about. What they call a dug well. They dig down and they hit water adjacent to the, with the water level, adjacent to it, it have a subterranean pool. That is, the water come up to a certain level, go off in this pool, and there were steps leading up out of the well, and the people would go down, and that was always fresh, well, it was spring water, it was spring water, see? Feeding this, and there would be fresh water they draw, and they'd walk up the steps. So she, she would come walking up the steps, she'd come out of the well. And, uh, Says that she was a uh, she was a very beautiful woman, very fair, very very beautiful. And she was chaste. She was a virgin. She was chaste and pure. How do you know all that? I I don't know how he knew all that. I I understand that in those days harlots used to dress a certain way. So sometimes people the way they dressed or could tell what they were. But she she was uh, the kind of woman he was looking for. In the days of David, his daughters dressed a certain way. Yeah. And a servant ran, ran to meet her. And he said the same thing that Prophet Elijah said. He said, give me a little cake. He said, I pray thee, let me drink a little water. <laughs> said the same thing. Because <laughs> the main thing is that when he's thirsty, the main thing was the sign. Mm -hmm. That's right. That was the main thing. Now he's proving all things here, see. He could tell by look at this looks this looks this looks like this may be the one. But I, wait, I got to go a little further. I, I got to prove all things. Amen. So I got to go through this test. That's what the scripture says to do in First Thessalonians five twenty one. Says prove all things. Put it to the test. If there's something you're going to do and you're not sure. Put it to the test. Don't do it till you're sure. Often testing, prove all things. They're thinking of find out what's wrong. But in this case, just find out what's right. Yeah, amen. It's just a little, a little more edifying. Isn't it? In the process, you find out what's wrong. But the main thing, the main thing isn't find out what's wrong. Yeah. The main thing is find out what's right. Yeah. So I said, let me, I pray thee, drink a little water from your pitcher. <clears throat> Remember, this is not not a request from a member of her family. <laughs> it's a total stranger, not even from that area. He may have looked like he wasn't from the area too, I don't know, but total stranger. Someone might have said, we got to be careful. Ah, Rebecca, you got to be careful about talking to strangers down there at the well. Let's see when you're people of God, you kind of have a different way of thinking. You're not... You're not sloppy. I understand that, but there are certain matters that are known only to the saints of God, like like the servant knowing this was the right woman. Some people, the saints of God, have the capacity to recognize such things that are approved of God, where other people don't. If they're asking for some kind of indication, they know what kind of indication to ask for. 
These kind of things are the pearls that you don't cast before swine. These are the kind of things that only the saints know. These are the kind of things you don't cast before the swine. So she did. She gave him a drink. When she had done giving him a drink, she said, I'll draw water for the camels also until they have done drinking. All right, now we get down to this matter that uh, Brother Gene mentioned. Camels. Because I've carried water to big animals. Yeah. The water in five-gallon buckets. Camels store their water in their hump. Mm -hmm. Sometimes water, uh, some camels have been known to go for a couple of months without taking a drink of water. Store it in their hump. It stores up to 52 gallons. At any single drink, and they, a camel drinks from 20 to 50 gallons. One, one camel. 20 to 50 gallons. Okay. Now we got 10 camels. Got one woman, one pitcher. I looked up, they said that pitcher is probably about two and a half gallons. We got this two and a half gallon pitcher, 10 camels. They're going to drink till they stop drinking. Oh, well, just be conservative. Let's say that uh, they just drank the minimum 20 gallons. That'd be 200 gallons of water. About four 55 gallon drums full of water. If they drank 50 gallons, which they might have because the journey had been during a long time, that'd be 500 mm -hmm. gallons of water or about 10 55 gallon drums. Two and a half gallon jug. Now I don't know if this is how it worked or not, but this is just to show how what this was. Two and a half gallon jug. Two hundred gallons of water. That would be eighty times down the steps, up the steps. Okay. You have the five hundred gallons. That'd be two hundred times down the stairs, up the stairs. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it is mind-boggling. But see, we should think that of the things God requires, we should think in terms of I'm going to have to have a lot of strength to do this. This is, this is how we should think. No matter what it is, you're going to say, I'm going to have to have your strength, Lord, to do this. So she did. She drew water till those camels quit drinking. And the scripture says she hasted and emptied her picture into the trough. And I, and I had a picture of a well I had there. There's a trough. And then they went downstairs into the well. So she, she gave him a drink out of her pitcher. He obviously didn't drink two and a half gallons because he asked for a little drink. She poured the rest so some of the camels would get started right away. And then loaded up. What was all that? That was God at work. Amen. See, the fervent had asked God what he wanted to see, so God brought this. This is the kind of work God does. And this wasn't a husky man, this is a woman. Beautiful woman. That's an introduction to how God works. You know where it says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? That is, it means feed the cat, drink, give the camels water. Give the camels water. Yeah, if you think it's hard, it's God that works in us both the will and do of his own good pleasure. See, the truth of the matter is that God doesn't work through slothful and disinterested people. God doesn't even work through Amen. people like this. Amen. So they're, they're excluded. They're excluded from the work right, right away. Amen. See, when professing Christians are more zealous for earthly duties than for working out their own salvation with fear and trembling, well, that's a dangerous condition to be in. Yes. The blessing that Rebecca got, yeah. she, was, she got to marry Isaac. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. It was worth it, wasn't yes, it? Yes, amen. amen. Well, she was watering her own camels. Yeah. <laughs> she didn't know it, but she didn't know it then. Yeah, she didn't know it then. That's right. Her future inheritance, yeah. Yeah. I was yeah. Thinking about the angel going before this request that, yeah. that um, Abraham had made, and uh, when someone goes before you, there are evidences of where they've traveled. 
and mm -hmm. the path that they have taken. Mm -hmm. That these things were evidences that the Lord was giving this servant that this is the way his angel had passed yeah. and this is the way to follow it. Amen. 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 Who knows how many times Rebecca had done this before. She knew what to do. So it wasn't yeah. like she, she's just a, yeah. a novice at this. She knows what she's saying when she says I'll water them That's right. until they're full. She, <laughs> I was looking I was looking at this picture or this painting down here. I, well, I always thought there was just like one. But he, now he picked from a whole bunch of women. Oh yeah, because they all yeah. came down. It was a time when the women. It's the he time just, of day when they came. Yeah. He, he yeah. picked one, and that that's was right. the one. And that's that's right. right. She stood out. That's the, that's part of the angel's work too. See, yeah. right. enable him to spot her. Now the last verse of our text says, "The man wondering at her held his peace." Wondering at her means he kept his eye on her, was and watched her while she's hoofing up and down the stairs, pouring out the water. How long this took, I have no idea. He's watching her. Is she going to finish the job? Is she... But he kept his eye on her, and she. He held his peace. He didn't say, "Hurry up now, let's hurry up." We gotta. He held his peace. Let things work out. There's time to do that, brother. There's time to sit back and watch and be quiet. Just be quiet and watch. He held his peace and looked. He wasn't looking all over there at the fields and that. He's, he's watching this Rebecca. In a sense, the Holy Spirit does this. The Holy Spirit ministers to you. He moves you to do this or that, and then he watches. See how the thing's going to play out. I speak as a man. That's the manner of the kingdom. Now here we see the uh, unsettling nature of an entertainment-centered society. They couldn't watch a woman <laughs> toting water. See, this this would be boring. Yeah. And the things that you look at when you're in Christ, the things that have captured your attention, the things you consider, they see they don't they look like they look like you've like you're not don't have all your marbles to the world. Doesn't look like you well, one of us doesn't have all our marbles. We're willing to admit that, just which one. But this, those that are engaged in the work of God are interested in what's happening. Particularly if they've got some kind of investment in this. They're interested in what happens. That's the manner of the kingdom. I thought to myself, I don't want to dwell on this, but I thought, I heard another person actually make a comment about this. How many millions of dollars have been invested in Christian youth work? And the person, his assessment was it was in the billions. Staggering amount. It is. And it has hardly yielded anything. Yeah. 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 Amen. Now in conclusion, You may see yourself somewhere in this account here. Maybe it will be in, a, in the stead of a, a Re Rebecca, who you, you have a sense that there's some, something you need to do for the people of God and you set about to do it, no matter how much it is or how demanded it is. Maybe, maybe you're, in a, you're in the place of the elder servants. You're out looking for somebody. But it's not just anybody. We're just not looking for numbers. It's not what we're looking for. We're looking for a wife for our Lord. Yeah, that's right. See? Changes the whole picture. Sound theology recognizes that God did not behold what took place among men and then determine what he was going to do. Yeah, that's right. He determined what he was going to do and then the things took place among men. Amen. Important to see that. And then may you have the uh, may you have the kind of grace that's needed to assess your journey, whether to this point has been successful or not. That's what we want for everybody here. See, we want everybody here to be able to look at their life and review it and say, "I've the Lord given me success. He's he given me success, and I prospered my journey this far. I'm I'm at the well, and I'm drinking." 
And I have a heavy prospect ahead. That's what we desire for everybody. It's all in this text. See, it's all here. Very wonderful text of Scripture. Any of you have something you'd like to add tonight before we close? A few weeks ago, you were we were talking at the meeting, and you brought this up about the angel going before him. And um, this, I've been thinking about this, and, and this has greatly comforted me in my own circumstances. We all have our own circumstances. You yeah. see, this this thought that the Lord's going before you, He's the, the reason you you ever find any success or any any um any prospering here is because He has gone before That's you. Right. He's made it possible. Now, when it happens. Now it's your responsibility to identify it and give glory to the Lord. Mm -hmm. That's the that you you're called into the equation. You don't actually do the work of, of, of prospering, but when it when it's when you're blessed in it, you gotta be able to identify it yeah. and be, give glory to God. Otherwise, he's a very jealous God. Mm. And so, you know, when when you when you give him glory for something that you perceived him to do, well, this is a great, great price in heaven. Amen. Amen. Yes. I was considering at the beginning of the last time you saying God works things so that no one else can get the credit <coughs> yeah. for it. Yes. Um, I considered when she, the king of Sodom offered yes. Abraham yes. the goods of the Good. city in replacement for the men. And this is Abraham, Abraham's response. I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from, from a take from a thread, even to a shoe latchet, mm -hmm. and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham. Yes, Abraham. yes. Amen. 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 I see that. God is That's receiving right. full glory out of all the works. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Brother Gibbon. Yes. A couple of things. Um, <coughs> I was thankful for this uh, emphasis that you brought out on um, servant praying. And I couldn't help but think of the servant beholding the conversation of his master yeah, and yeah. seeing seeing that this is what his master did. And so he, he was compelled to do the same and, yes, and, amen. and believing that the Lord would, would guide him. And, and the other thing, too, is that the Lord knew that Rebecca was the one for Isaac. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had made her for Isaac. Yeah. And... I, you can always almost kind of see behind the scenes how the Lord's directing the servant to pray because he knew how it would, right. Rebecca That's would be. Right. Amen. And so the Lord, you can see how we're able to enter into to the work with the Lord. When you're near the Lord, you know how to pray because you think like the Lord yeah. thinks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he says that those the Lord, the Lord will show them his secret. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, well, Aaron. I appreciate what you said about Abraham making these uh, conclusions and thinking about the promise that was given. So he thinks about his seed in the next generation and the succeeding generation that would result uh, from that. And it, uh, I think about what Paul said to the Romans that were transformed, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Mm -hmm. And that that mind work that, that Abraham invested in what God had said Transformed then how he conducted yes. us. Amen. Yeah, right. Amen. Mm -hmm. Good Mike. I like Abraham's reasoning and uh, sending the servant back to his kindred to get a wife for Isaac. He could have reasoned, well, I'm here in the promised land. This is the land that's promised to me, so I'll take a wife from this land. But and this, is, mm -hmm. this is speculation, but I believe he was thinking that since this land is promised to me, that means the people that are here now are going to have to go. That's right. so I, don't want to, I don't want a wife for my son. From have to go. Amen. Also, um, so, uh, something I've never seen before, in Genesis chapter 22, they list all of uh, Abraham's brother's children. Yeah. And I think Rebecca is the only woman. As we don't know for sure, but... <laughs> But when Abram and a servant, they keep yeah. saying the woman. The woman. What if the woman, not a woman, yeah. the not woman. If, he doesn't say, well, look for another one. So that's all the woman. Another one. Yeah. What if right. the woman will not come? Yeah. And then come back home. They're yeah. done. Yeah, so right. they, he went on that trip for one woman. That's right. And that's, that's a good 
of the type oh, of wash amen, dryer say amen. Amen. <laughs> and then also um, I was thinking that, that was the nature of the servant's prayer then because the only time they talked about women in plural is when he got to the well or the, the daughters of the men or the women of the men of the city of the city so it could be that the nature of his prayer was not help me find the right woman but the woman the woman that's good the, the woman amen the one single female of amen. my master's kindred amen. show me which one she is yeah. amen yeah. we know amen. that's the way it is at the end of the time that's right yeah i remember when the lord appeared to abraham in the vision in genesis 15 remember he said the iniquity of the amorite is not yet full. Yeah. abraham remembered that word those people and that land were full of iniquity, yes, and it was going to get more. It was going to get, get worse. worse. Yeah. 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 He, did, he didn't want his son Amen. joined to one of those women. Amen. Amen. All those years he remembered that. Yeah. All right, we'll have a word of prayer. All right, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this record, for the faith of Abraham, and for the example of his eldest servant. We pray that this kind of faith will be found in each one of us, Father, in Jesus' name, amen. amen.